it's time again for Q and Amabel. This is where you ask questions and I provide answers. In the comments to my most recent video essay, a couple people asked if I'd heard of the game Mao. No, I hadn't, but I have now. This is a game in which you don't know the rules, and as you're playing the game, if you get the rules wrong, you get penalties, and that is how you learn how to play the game. And it's a folk game, so there are like regional variations. That sounds so frustrating. I love it. Um, it's a game I would hate to play, but would love to inflict upon others. I don't know what that says about me. Thank you for telling me about it. A number of people have asked me what my book is about. Uh, here's one of them. Um, and that's a good question. My book is about board games. Specifically, it's about how board games can be used as a tool to model, understand, and critique systems, particularly systems of oppression. And this is because board games are themselves systems, and they are those systems made literal and tangible so you can manipulate them. And in order to play a board game in the first place, you need to understand how it works on a systemic level. Like a video game, you can just play the game, and the game operates a lot of itself for you. But with a board game, in order to even begin playing it, you need to understand the entire picture. And because of that, it's a very good tool for understanding the entire picture of real world systems. The book will start by establishing this premise and then showing how board games model systems. I'm gonna have uh, some history about modeling in games, particularly with war games, both uh, professional and board war games. And then I'm gonna talk about different ways to approach modeling. Uh, one which is very high on immersion and, and the identity, the role the player uh, assumes in the game, and the other being the opposite tact something that's more about, like, uh, alienation and distance and the, the Verfremdengs effect. Verfrem, Verfremdengs effect. I don't actually know how to pronounce that. And every time I have to write it in the book, I just, I just copy and paste it. So, you know, the, this word. <laughs> and that's the part I'm working on presently, and that's the part that relates most to my own work. So it's a little weird because I'm writing about my own games, and I, I do that a lot, but it seems weird to do that in a book. I'll get over it, probably. As the designer and publisher of several train games, why do you think people like trains? You know, it's funny because I only designed my first train game because I wanted to work with Winsome Games because John Bohr is such a strong developer, and I knew uh, that early in my career I needed to work with a strong developer in order to, like, learn my craft. So... Uh, I did a train game, but that was all that he published. And then I liked working with him, kept working with him, kept doing train games. And now people like the train games that I do for some reason, so I keep doing them. Um, do I like trains? I like some things that have trains in them. I like westerns, a lot of trains and westerns. In fact, like my first game, North and Pacific, uh, would not exist if I wasn't like obsessed with Once Upon a Time in the West and... The idea of knowing where the train was going to have to pass through and making your investment there. That's, that's what that game is. North and Pacific is basically an adaptation of Once Upon a Time in the West with less violence and sexism. And I really like the anime Galaxy Express 3.9 that made an indelible impression on me as a kid. It's very depressing. And also, I really like Tokyuger, the Power Rangers, but trains. But that's marked as a silly. I don't know if I actually like trains. I don't know why people like trains. I'm sorry if this didn't answer your question. Considering that you normally hand make every product, how does it make the option of having second editions easier? Have you tweaked the production process for games if you've got used to making them, which has resulted in differences in the finished product? Other than the little wood bits, which Mary and I personally put into bags, we don't actually make the games by hand. That's our printing partner, Blue Panther. Does that make it easier for us to do second editions? Yes, you know, generally, if there's some like, little errata or something, we can fix that uh, pretty soon after the game has started going into production because like, oh, we had this little error, let's fix it going forward. Uh, we don't really do a lot of second editions though. I mean, I guess it is easier. That is like the advantage of a print-on-demand model, but um, I don't like going back and revising things after they're done. I like to move forward and do the next thing. You know, I have some games, some older games, where I'm not entirely happy with how they turned out in retrospect. I liked them a lot when they came out, and then, you know, some years later, I become dissatisfied with my work. I think that's pretty normal for most creative people. And 
you know, are like, well, those C movement rules in supply lines, people keep complaining about those, and they're probably right, but I'm not going to fix it. I'm not going to spend my time going back and changing something that's already out in the world when I can use that energy to make something new and better, you know, now. And that's it for the questions that I have to answer. So, um, thank you and take care.